Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I couldn't be better, Tim. Just a fantastic day. How are you? Oh, I am doing well as well. Thank you very much for asking. And I hope everyone out there is doing well. Yeah, me too. Me too. I hope that goes without saying. For you God's know what? Sake. Yeah, I hope it goes without saying also. I really want to start this new year off, 2022. I think that's going to be my new thing. I'm, you're going to ask me how I'm doing. I'm going to say I'm doing great. And then I'm going to ask you how you're doing. And then I'm going to wish everybody a good day. I'm going to say, and I hope everyone out there is having a good day. That's my new thing. So get ready for it. You won't do it. <laughs> I'll, no, you're right. I'll forget. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lance, in this episode, we have on an old friend. It's James Renner. He's an author and journalist. He has covered a lot of the lot of cold cases, missing persons cases, notably Maura Murray's case. And he's got a new podcast called True Crime This Week. And he also reinvented the definition of gumshoe during this interview. The actual definition is quite boring. Uh, so we're just going to go with his definition during this interview. If you want to look it up, you can look it up. But I, I'm telling you, it's boring. And make sure to check out Renner's nonprofit called The Porchlight Project. And you can find info about it at porchlightonline.org. So check out The Porchlight Project. He's doing a lot of great things over there. And James is still covering the Amy Mahalovic unsolved murder. And we get into that a little bit. We also really run the gamut here with topics that we cover with James. And that just kind of shows how multifaceted our relationship is with him. You, you, we don't really stay on one particular topic for too too long. Uh, we we cover school shootings because he's got young children. Tim, you have young children, and that just came up in the course of this conversation. It's something that's out there, and it's really interesting what he has to say about it, especially his son's experience and, and what's going on in his area with uh, with preventing school shootings and, and how that's being approached. I thought that was a really uh, surprisingly fascinating part of this conversation. Yeah, it's always interesting talking with James Renner, and uh, I hope you find it interesting as well. Check out his new podcast, True Crime crime this week there is a link in the show notes and there's links to follow him on social media as well and just because james is doing that podcast doesn't mean that he stopped doing philosophy of crime that is still out there so you can check him out as well philosophy of crime is his other podcast and when you go to the Porchlight Project's website, that's porchlightonline.org, you'll notice that it says major funding provided by the Audio Chuck Endowment Fund. That's Ashley Flowers' company, Audio Chuck. And I think that's just such a cool move to have an endowment fund to see people in your uh, industry, appear in your industry. She's a podcaster and an advocate and she has a massive following and it's clear that she's doing the proverbial talking the talk and walking the walk. So just a quick shout out to her there. She also donated to private investigations for the missing Bruce Maitland's nonprofit. So I just wanted to give a quick thank you for that as well. Really generous. And uh, again, it's always refreshing to see people doing the right thing with the influence that they have. All right. Big thanks to Ashley. And thank you very much for listening, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. James Renner, how are you today? I'm great. I'm zooming at you from the 1950s uh, and the stockings are hung by the chimney with care. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Whatever you whatever you celebrate. How, how are things going uh, there? Oh, I see uh, Lance is on the Kubrick set from 2001. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Just my uh, just my attic. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, but but yes, I uh, I would like to be on the on the Kubrick set from 2001. But hold on, we need to address you zooming from the 50s and how you have uh, you've committed to this character. You've committed to the lovable gumshoe. Well, yeah, my wife said I I, sh I really should be committed, and uh, so you know, wait, but but I think <laughs> I might have misunderstood her what she was trying to tell me. But but yeah, anyways, no, I I'm I'm in. I'm in the mode. I gotta, I gotta get into the gumshoe mode, so that when I'm done, I can take it all off and put on a nice cozy sweater and be and be just you know James Vitamin J instead <laughs> of uh, James Renner uh, gumshoe. Vitamin J. My goodness, you you must be all caffeinated today. I don't, I don't know what is going on. I feel like on. I'm super caffeinated right now. I, you know, it's funny. I did I did just down an entire uh, Coke in a, in the span of about uh, five minutes. Nice. Well, caffeine's my favorite drug, and uh, <laughs> James Renner. James Renner's my favorite drug. Oh yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, where does the term gumshoe come from? Uh, it goes back to the early days of yellow journalism, where in order to tell if a reporter has done their job, they come back to the office and the editor checks the bottom of their shoes for gum, knowing that they went out and beat the streets. I'm joking. I have no idea. But doesn't that doesn't that sound like it should be? <laughs> that was exactly <laughs> what I wanted. Yeah, no, I have no up. idea. Yeah, somebody look it up. Sounds really gross, though. So many people uh, dropping gum on the street. There's nothing, no, nothing else to do back in the day. James Renner, please tell us about your new podcast, True Crime, this week. What if I just said no? What if I'm like, no, no, I'm not going to, <laughs> not at all. But true Crime... This week, yeah, I've had the philosophy of crime now for a couple of years, and I do just a season, which is six episodes once a year. So it's it's fun to have those six episodes, but then people wanted more Renner, and I'm like, I, I, I should give it to them, you know? So uh, I, <laughs> I started thinking uh, that, what you know, I've got all these opinions. If you follow my Twitter feed or my Insta or my TikTok or my repod, or or what have you, my MySpace. Um, I, I'm constantly commenting on the true crime that's in the news. So basically, I just wanted to um, make a quick cash grab and 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 bundle that all into uh, a, a prepackaged show that comes out every every Friday morning. So that when you are getting up to punch in at the factory in the the flats of Cleveland on your way you can uh, pull up the podcast and you'll get all the big true crime news of that week coming at you in my dulcet tones. Uh, and so I do updates on uh, the top two true crime stories. We do updates on uh, what happened in cold cases that week. And then there's a, a, a part where I get into the genetic genealogy because genetic genealogy is solving new cases every week. And uh, I, I try to keep it kind of light, kind of fun. And uh, as much as you can with true crime, and uh, it's it seems to to be doing well. It's it's off to a good start, better than philosophy of crime at, at the beginning, and uh, just seeing where it goes and having fun with it so far. That is uh, super impressive. You were right though; the world needed more James Renner, and <laughs> you were very gracious to spread yourself <laughs> so so wide and and vast. I waited a long time. I waited for the right opportunity. And when Silk City Hot Sauce came along with a sponsorship, I'm like, all right, I was waiting for Apple, but you know, we're we're gonna we're gonna make we're gonna do this. Let's roll. <laughs> Googling so, uh, Silk City Hot Sauce right now. SilkCityHotsauce.com. I've got a coupon code. I don't know what it is, but if you listen to my podcast, it's on there. They have uh various flavors like sweet heat or uh mango madness. <laughs> so it it fits, I think, so, a little bit better with true crime than like, uh, you know, those old, uh, I don't know if they're still with you. Is Apron still with you? No. Oh, fuck them then. Okay. <laughs> it, it, it works. <laughs> it works a lot better than that, I think. Well, that sounds pretty good. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, what's interesting, I really like getting back into something kind of newsy. You know, one of my favorite jobs was working as a reporter at, at, at scene and, you know, being able to see news develop and it changing every week and getting back into news a little bit, even if it's just to kind of organize these top these top uh, stories is, is a lot of fun because you see how quickly things change and how weird things are. Because from week to week, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. And then, you know, something comes out of the blue, like the uh, Gabby Petito case and becomes this huge thing. And then two weeks later, we move on to something else and and uh, it's equally as weird. People, they will find new and clever ways to commit crime. And it's 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 bizarre. It's a it's a it's an insight into humanity a little bit not all of it's bad either where do you get your news um uh, headlines where do you get your news updates do you have just multiple alerts that you've programmed to get emailed to you and and if so what are your keywords <laughs> you know that's a good question um i it, they they come in from all over the place honestly one of the reasons i thought to do a, this podcast is people started tagging me on weird crime stories on social media mostly twitter and you know people send me links to reddit and it's like hey have you seen this and it's like oh why i, I have no outlet for this why i mean it's interesting but a lot of them come from you know other people i know i'm on reddit a lot as you know and uh some odd stories come through that way. And then 
it's pretty easy to see, you know, what's what's trending every week. I I try to make this a podcast, not just for the states, but for the world, Lance, for the world. And so, uh, you know, at the top of the at the top of the podcast, I see these are the top true crime stories in the world. So I'm also reading The Guardian uh, out of the UK and Australia, and checking uh, Der Spiegel for news out of Germany and Sudoku, the big newspaper out of Japan. So I'm constantly, I'm just trying to figure out what's, what's, what's the, the cool, big, interesting crime stories of the, of the week. And how long has your new show been on? It's been going since uh, October 15th. And uh, yeah, it should be, you know, True Crime This Week. If you like and subscribe, you'll get it on your, your phone or device Friday mornings for your, for your uh, commute into work if anybody's commuting anymore. Well, tell us about the Porchlight Project. Any uh, any new cases, any new solves over there? You know, we're in this uh, heated competition over uh, solves. We've got some for private investigations for the missing that uh, we've come very close at and some we can't really talk about yet. So uh. I think we're at about 100. What, what are you at? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, that was very early on. I, I lost <laughs> count at some point. <laughs> Uh, no, um, we've, we've, we've had some very good luck starting out and, um, we are doing really well right now. We're one of the, uh, cases that we're looking into is this young man who was found in a barrel in Cleveland in this like construction site or this, uh, abandoned like little factory, um, back in 1969, a young African-American man. And, and he, you know, they found him in this barrel, which, you know, we're pretty sure it's murder and, uh, Nobody knew this man's identity all the, all this time. So Porchlight Project is funding new DNA testing and genetic genealogy. The DNA testing's already been done, and we got some data from that, which the genetic genealogists are right now trying to use to locate a family tree. And we've we've gotten far enough where we think we found members of his extended family. He's got a very unique bone structure to his face, a very unique look, and these these uh these people have that as well but it's it's been difficult to get people to open up and kind of hear us out you you know you call somebody up in like rural georgia uh and say hey do you happen to know we're we're you know we're looking for this man member of your family who was possibly murdered you know 50 years ago and they tend not to you know they're, they're they're pretty suspicious of that so we're we're getting very close on that one and uh, we also just took on a, a, another new case that I'm very excited about just because of the, the weird, so many weird like coincidences pop up and you've got this like, uh, you know, people call it synchronicity or whatever. But a couple of years ago, I wrote a, um, uh, a book called Copperhead Island that opened up with the discovery of a young woman's body who had washed up on the shore of Lake Erie uh, near Sandusky, near Cedar Point out here, which is a big amusement park. And that kind of kick-started the mysteries of, of this book and, and, the, and the search for the truth. Well, this case kind of came to us, and it's a young woman's body who was found washed up on the shore of Lake Erie near Cedar Point. Uh, I mean, it's, it's the exact opening of my book. And the body was discovered on March 30th, 1980, which was my birth date. You know, it was, I would have turned two that day. So it's like, you know, the universe is, is, is saying, this is the one you got to go for. So uh, we just got that one and the sample went to the lab and and they're testing for DNA. I'm sure we have the DNA. Uh, I'm sure we'll have that. So once we have the data, you know, go to the uh, genetic genealogists. And I think, I think we'll have an answer on that one pretty soon. When did you write the book? And you said it was Copper Island? Copperhead Island. It's the sequel to Primrose Lane. It's just sitting on a shelf um, somewhere. And we're, you know, Primrose Lane has gotten close to being uh, a TV show. And it's being kind of revamped as, as a possible movie. Um, so long story short, I'm waiting for something to happen with uh, the TV thing before we release the, the sequel book. Um, Eventually, Primrose Lane will be a trilogy, and with Copperhead Island being the the second book of that that trilogy of of weird sci-fi true crime type of novel mystery. And the actual body was discovered in 1980. And, and do you plan on using elements of that for part of the trilogy now that that's in your world as a, as a reality? 
Yes, I absolutely will. In my in in my story, I'm not going to spoil you know spoil it because you learn fairly early on. But you find out that the young woman is from Ukraine, and uh, she had come off a super secret private island on Lake Erie that's owned by like the one percenters, you know, of the the area. And uh, they hire Eastern European women on student visas to run the island and do things that, that whatever they want them to do in the summers. So, and that's kind of loosely based off like some real things that go on on these, these private islands on Lake Erie. So if it turns out that she came off this, you know, one of these private rich islands, then, uh, then I'll start getting really creeped out. Interesting. You had mentioned those islands a while ago in a conversation. Can you, can you elaborate just a bit more on those? If you're from around Northeast Ohio area, you're familiar with the islands on Lake Erie. There's Kelly's Island, which is where you take the family and there's like a place you can camp and uh, see the old grooves that the glaciers left behind. And then you've got the Party Island, which is uh, South Bass Island. And there's Putin Bay there, which is where all the college kids go to, to drink and have a good time. And so you've got South Bass, Middle Bass, and then North Bass. Those are some quieter islands. But if you're on South Bass and you look west, you'll see another island. And you ask the people that live around there, you're like, hey, what's what's that other one? How come I can't get to that island? And, and they're like, oh, that's... Uh, let me tell you the tale of Rattlesnake Island. That's when you learn that this it's a private island that was that was originally owned by the Catholic Church, kind of creepy. And they used it as a summer camp up until like the 70s. And then around uh, like late 70s, early 80s, around this time, this, this body shows up. I'm not saying there's a connection. There's not going to be a connection. But this group of uh, private individuals bought up the island. And in order to become a member of the Rattlesnake Island Club and get access to the island, you you have to first pay the $93,000 initiation fee. And then there's a yearly fee to remain there. You can, you can buy and purchase a house there if you want. There's just a little bit of room. There's always been rumors that that's where like some of the old mobsters went to retire and to kind of lay low. And uh, they've got this this and they do hire young women from Eastern Europe on student visas to run the restaurant there and to bartend and to do hospitality during the summer. And they don't really let these these young women off the island. They have like a 24 hour off time between Saturday and Sunday, I guess. And they have to pay their own way like off the island if they want to go for a couple hours. So it's kind of weird. It's 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 creepy. You know, why are you know, one one reason you'd want to staff your island with people from another country is so that nobody goes back to the mainland and, and talks about what happens on the island. So I've always been interested there. It's mostly it's mostly lawyers and uh, real estate developers and, and things like that. But it did used to be used as a um, stopover for bootlegging back during Prohibition, where they were running liquor between Canada and uh, the and the states. Very interesting. Tell us about Amy Mahalovic's case. You had mentioned that there was some new stuff going on in that case. So they they came out with a new piece of information on the anniversary this year, which is October 27th. That's when Amy Mahalovic was abducted back in 1989. So now we're what 32 years into the into the mystery. Remember a couple of years back they brought out this kind of avocado green curtain and it had been found about 100 yards from where her body was found way back then. And they were never sure that it was connected to her case. So I wish they would have come out with that information back in 89 or 90. But um, they waited because they weren't sure it was connected. But then they found a sample from the the uh, curtain had a hair from a dog. And one of the FBI agents from back then was smart enough to collect samples of dog hair from the the, the dog that lived uh, at Amy's house, like the household pet, and um, it matched. So that's when they first realized about five years ago that this curtain was definitely related to what happened or was most likely used to wrap up her body during transport. 
but still they weren't hundred percent sure. So the little bit of new info that came out this year was that yes, in fact, we tested the curtain again. We This time we found Amy's hair on the curtain. So hundred percent definitive, this, this curtain is part of the mystery. So they brought it out again and asked people if they recognized the this odd curtain. It's a it's a narrow curtain. And what what makes it especially odd is that it had started out as a, a bedspread that had been used that somebody had hand sewn and repurposed into a um, into a curtain. So uh, you know who would who would know how to do that. I mean, she was found out in the country where you kind of repurpose a lot of material and people grow up, you know, back, you know, patching pants and, you know, with, with old beds and you know, things like that. So I've always found the curtain particularly interesting for a couple of reasons. Um, I've got my top suspect. Um, you know, there's, there's a guy that I think remains on the list for everybody who was a former teacher and he had an alcove in his science classroom where this narrow curtain would have fit just perfectly. And we went back and looked at pictures from the late 80s of his classroom. And it's hard to tell, but, you know, there's there's a similar shaped curtain there. And, you know, you think to, well, who would have had the experience to to sew it, right? And before this guy was a teacher, he worked as a seamster. You know, he he worked at, at a he just sat at a sewing machine all day. So I think that's a particularly good clue. I think that case is still going to rely on on some of this new DNA technology. You know, I, I hope that they're utilizing the new tests and genetic genealogy, but I they keep things real real hush hush over there. And when you say we, you said uh, we looked at pictures from the 80s of his classroom mm -hmm. who's we is it you have a team of people or <laughs> no i just i just mean that the people online that follow the case um i still run a blog for the amy mihalovic case where i update you know periodically not as much as like you know the more murray case or anything people still go on there and comment and so it's just you know, the people that follow the case on online. Cool. And I think that's important to uh, to note is that when you're saying we, you're you're talking about the, the community online that is following and trying to contribute in a in a positive way, in a respectful, responsible way. How, how closely do you work with these people? Do, is it like email, phone, text? Yeah. You know, I after writing the book, just like, you know, with True Crime Addict, I, I wrote a book on the Amy Mihalovic case a few years before that. And that kind of makes me the lightning rod for for information. So um, it's not quite as organized as the the people that follow the Moore Murray case. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll get emails uh, weekly on the, the Mihalovic case. And every time there's a little bit of new information or a new suspect that pops up, the people that know about that will go will will go online. They'll Google. They'll find me, and then they'll send me the info. So whatever the police are getting, I tend to get like the next day, or or vice versa. I'll get something, and then I'll send them to the police. So I'm kind of you know when something happens in the case, I, I kind of I you know I get a heads up, and and sometimes I'll write about it. A lot of it, just like the Murray case, as as you've seen. Over time, it just becomes noise and, you know, the same things being repeated over and over and over again. It's like, you know, did anybody, you know, she got calls at home. Maybe somebody should run, you know, let's go back and run the 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 phone records. And it's like, well, first of all, you're talking 32 years ago. Secondly, I'm sure that's one of the first things they did. And third, you know, it, um, you know, technology's changed so much that back then, all you were able to figure out is is that uh, whoever was calling Amy at home was was calling from a local number because they only logged the long distance at, at that time. 90%, nothing new under the sun. But then, you know, every, you know, probably a couple times a year, somebody will send me something and it's like, oh my God, you know, this is, this is, this is a great tip. You know, maybe this will shake something, you know, so far it hasn't, it hasn't quite, quite been enough. And what's your interaction like with the family, with Amy's family? Are you still uh, communicating with them? I still see them, you know, so I do library talks around here, especially in the fall about all sorts of things. Uh, I, I wrote a book on local myths and monsters and, and legends. And so like around Halloween time, I'll do some library talks about that. And uh, I went out to Grafton in October of this year and there was a, a woman sitting in the audience as I got there and I'm like, oh, she looks really familiar. And uh, it was, it's uh, Amy Mihalovic's father's 
wife, you know, that he met after she, after she passed and uh, he remarried. So she, yeah, they still, they still keep in touch and show up at my events every once in a while. It's, it's nice uh, to have that interest and support from a family that you've, that you've written about on one of these cold cases. Uh, You know, it's very different from you know, I've, you know, honestly, I've only ha- ever had the one bad experience and it's just, it's that one that never, <laughs> never goes away. They're, they're great. And hopefully, you know, one day we'll have, we'll have an answer for them. Um, I, I remember, you know, the, the one, one thing I, I come back to a lot is, is Amy's father after one of these library talks, he came up to me and he's like, Hey, you want to just come back to the house for a cheeseburger? And nobody's ever invited me to, to their home just for a cheeseburger before. And I'm not one to say no to any, any of that. So, um, I went back to his house and we hung out in his kitchen and, uh, he microwaved me a hamburger. I, they must've had it like the night, night before. It was really good though. And, um, we just sat around and, and talked mostly about stuff that had nothing to do with the case, you know, talked about his grandkids and his house and, and, uh, you know, the, the, somehow we got around to the topic a, just a little bit and, uh, the, the idea of closure came up and he, and he's like, you know, after all these years, he's like, there never would have been closure. He's, and what he said was closure, closures for buildings, not people, closures for doors, not people. Um, we never really have closure. He's like, what I want. And now he's, he's older. He's like, what I want now before, you know, before the end is uh, he just wants to know, you know, he just wants to know. Um, and that would be enough for him. Even in, you know, I, even, I think without, I don't think he would necessarily even need to see somebody behind bars. He just wants to know. Yeah. Interesting point about closure. Yeah. We've had some conversations about this and kind of feel like it's uh, tough. I don't know. Even the word justice is, is kind of weird to me sometimes. Like I don't even mm-hmm. know what, what justice means sometimes. Right. With the Amy case, you know, what is justice in that case? Even if they find the guy at this point, he's been free for 32 years. He's not going to live. Whoever it is, is not going to live another 32 years if they're still alive today. You know, so they've already been free longer than they could possibly be put in prison. And what, what, um, you know, what I, the thought I had when I got really wrapped up in that case was in this case, I think justice really could just be getting the person in court, having them stand up and answer some questions about the case, even if they don't get a conviction, because, you know, there's enough that circumstantial evidence that you could indict somebody and you could indict, you know, there's a, you know, uh, there's a really, you know, there's a, there's some good suspects in the case and one kind of stands out above the others. And maybe that in this case, that's, that's justice, you know, where everybody kind of knows and maybe the, you know, I wouldn't want them to indict anybody that that's innocent, but if they have definitive evidence in their mind, um, that could, that could be it is just getting that person in, in, into the courtroom. And do you think that the person went on to commit other acts of violence after Amy? I don't, which is what makes this, case a little different. I think this, and this is a, a, this is not just something I came up with. This is an opinion that's shared by many of the FBI agents that work the case. It appears that in this case, this person, it's a one-off where they, they, it, it appears what happened was this, this person definitely, you would suspect has a history of being inappropriate with children, but not necessarily violence. And I think, you know, what, what, what some people think in this case is that he, arranged this meetup with her. He was calling her when she was home alone saying, Hey, I, I work with your mother. Why don't you meet me? She just got a promotion. Meet me at the shopping center um, on Friday afternoon and I'll take you to go get a present for her. It'll be our little secret. And so he, he had kind of come up with this way to get this girl in, in a car. And I think he didn't know what was going to happen after that. I think he thought that maybe there could be some sort of like relationship there or something. I don't think necessarily that murder was the intent when she was picked up. Uh, when you look into how she was she was killed, a you know, blunt object on, on the head likely knocked her out. And then she was drained of, of blood uh, by two incisions in her neck. So it seems kind of un, unplanned. And I think they didn't do it again. Um, I think the, you know, because you can't find, there's no other cases around Northeast Ohio, at least, that match up with the same MO. There's no other unsolved murders of, of girls Amy's age and 
location and especially that weird way of luring her with the phone call. So it's, you know, we're, we're looking for, you know, it's really hard to find a killer if they only do it once and uh, manage to get away with that one. So, you know, most of the top suspects in the case are men that, that had the means, motive, and opportunity and had this, this history of uh, being inappropriate with, with students or, or, or kids. So it's a, it's a strange, it's a strange case. Otherwise it would have been solved, you know? Right. Are some of the suspects still alive? Yeah. All the, uh, all the, all the men in my top, you know, my top three are still alive. There have been a couple in the, like the FBI's top 25 list that they keep. There have been a couple of those that have passed away, a couple suicides in there that are suspicious. There's also the possibility that we're looking at a, a weird crime here where you know, there's more than one man involved in the in the crime. And the more that time goes on, the more I, I consider that a distinct possibility. Because one of the ways that some of the top suspects could have gotten by all this time is, you know, one of them alibied the other out for part of it. You know, so the abduction, you know, one guy abducts her, but the other guy's the one that, that uh, disposes of the body. So they both kind of have alibis for part of it that seem to rule them out. And so you consider that maybe they, they work together. Once you get into those top suspects, you kind of see how they, they overlap. You know, they were frequenting the same creepy places and uh, they most likely knew each other. Not to get all, not to get all satanic panic, but um, you know, I, I think, I think it's definitely a possibility. There's a, there's a very new, um, you know, Back in January or February of this year, the the Bay Village Police got really excited about a new suspect, and they got uh, you know the local news found out that they had subpoenas and were issuing subpoenas to search um, storage spaces. And you know, in this 32 year old cold case murder, that's a pretty big deal. So, you know, who is this new suspect? And it um, you know they haven't published his name. But, you know, again, when that story broke, people came to me with and, and they're like, OK, we know here's who it is. And eventually I figured out who this guy was. And um, I was in, I was trying to figure out why the, the police were so very interested in this guy. One of the main things that 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 um, pops up with this guy is he's from he, he was living in Bay Village at the time. Uh, and then Amy's body was found like an hour away in Ashland County in the middle of nowhere. And the day that her body was found, this is like two and a half months after she disappeared, the FBI wrote down the license plate of every car that passed by the crime scene. And when this new suspect popped up on their list last year, they ran his license plate and found out he was one of the cars that drove by the the crime scene. So it's like, what was he doing down there at that moment? And uh, so that was, that was telling. And then I just kind of, you know, I was thinking about it more and more, and then I looked into where he's from, um, he, even though he was living in Bay Village, he was going to school at a different place, I'll say. And um, it was the same school district where my favorite suspect of all time happened to be teaching back then. So they totally would have been close to each other. They would have known each other. I'm, I, I've been told that they worked together, that you know he helped them out in the classroom, but I haven't been able to verify that yet. But it's weird that, uh, you know, this big new suspect that's on the police radar was so close to the guy that that uh, that I've been looking at all these years. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. Yeah. And, uh, you know, two people working together. My gosh, that seems really dark and uh it also just seems difficult to make that transition like if you see this person at work or at a bar like how do you go from from that to uh you know help me with this and then let's and then never do do it it again again. yeah not do it again and not talk about it well i think in this situation it was a um well let me talk about it this way there's another case that i looked into in akron years years ago that was the subject of a, a story i wrote called the serial killer's apprentice and it was a similar deal where um, there's the serial killer operating in Akron, and there's a lot of circumstantial evidence to suggest that he was um, training his uh, nephew in uh, the practices that he was doing, that his nephew was at least aware, maybe even, you know, um, 
how complicit we don't know, but uh, he was he was trying to train this kid as a serial killer. And um, so one way that something like that can happen is through grooming. And, you know, eventually you have almost like that, uh, that thing we talked about before that the idea the the folly I do, where you get close enough to somebody and you break those social paradigms down and suddenly what's not normal, it feels normal. And uh, then you can, then uh, they can operate together. And uh, that certainly happened in the, I believe, in the Akron case and, and could be something that we're looking at with uh, Bay Village as well. Yeah, just because I can't uh, figure out how that can happen in uh, my head doesn't mean that it doesn't happen in uh, the real world, grand scheme of things. I'm pretty innocent. It's probably it's probably good that you know you can't figure it out in your head, right? Yeah, to a lesser extent, I think you see some of that in like uh, things like the Tiger King, you know, where he's got these young men doing his his bidding uh, in exchange for you know favors and meth and you know hanging out with the tigers it's uh it's it's that same weird grooming until like you know what's up is down and down is down is up type of thing speaking of that i was looking through your latest episodes of true crime this week and i noticed that you spoke about the jesse smollett case um let's hear some thoughts on that because that is very up is down down is up yeah yeah uh oh, poor jesse uh, Smollett, um, you know, he was, he had it all, right. He was, uh, he was on one of the, the top shows on TV empire and he had, uh, his career was, was rocketing and it seems as though he had this, this thought, well, maybe I could just punch it up a little bit and, you know, get, uh, get some, get some, uh, street cred, uh, by getting beat up in Chicago and he comes up with this idea to, you know, w- what he said happened is that he was walking around Chicago and a couple of guys in mega hats uh, started yelling racial and homophobic slurs at him and then beat him up. And so he went to the police and it became this big thing. And like, uh, you know, everybody, all the celebrities commented on, on it, you know, justice for, for, for Jesse. And, and then, you know, if you've seen the Dave Chappelle special, I think he 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 tells it better than anybody else because he's like, you notice that you know that he didn't comment on it. He's like he, he's like I I thought he was guilty from the very beginning. And once you start looking at his the details in his case, it really does start to fall apart. The police, I, I don't know what he was thinking because the police obviously are going to look into this. And one of the first things they they did was track down the men involved in this alleged assault. And it turns out these, these men were African-American too. And you just, you're not going to find two African-American men in Chicago wearing MAGA hats, assaulting, assaulting somebody. It's just not like, it just it won't happen. Um, first of all, I don't you know, know that they would even wear MAGA hats. And uh, so all these questions started popping up and, and uh, then the, eventually it leads to this big trial. And I don't know if I, you know, What's funny is there was all this media attention. It was treated almost like uh, like a murder case, right? But really, he was just charged with what was it? Uh, uh, like felony counts of public disorder or something stupid like that. Like when, once you really got down to like what he was even charged with, it's like, buddy, why did he even take that to trial? You knew you were guilty. Just take the you know take take the you know, take the fine, take the probation. Don't, you know, but it became this whole media thing. And uh, um, he stuck to it to the very end. What was interesting in the Jesse Smollett case, too, that you're seeing more and more in these cases, like with what happened with Kyle Rittenhouse. So you're seeing these defendants take the stand. And that, you know, I don't know how that is changing, but, you know, until very recently, you never saw defendants on the stand. You know, they have nothing nothing uh, in their favor for that there's nothing they can win by going on the stand other than getting grilled by the the in cross cross examination so uh but jesse took the stand and you know uh, kyle rittenhouse did too jesse is an actor so maybe he thought you know i can i can just charm him i can charm that jury and uh it just didn't it didn't work out for him so who knows what what will happen i i I think anybody can come back. You know, it's it's possible he could, you know, look at Robert Downey Jr. Robert Downey Jr. didn't do anything 
quite that crazy, but you know, he, he, he was constantly getting arrested and, and now he's like one of the big stars. So it would be great to see a comeback story um, from that guy. So his next chapter will be interesting for sure. Yeah. Weird choice. The whole, the whole story, obviously the whole thing, the MAGA hats really unnecessary bringing politics into whatever he was trying to accomplish, I guess. Right. But I guess, I mean, I guess it was just, you know, media anyway, sort of a bizarre publicity stunt that, uh, went way wrong. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like a Coen Brothers movie, you know, you you start out with the best intentions and then everything goes horribly awry and uh, it makes it 10,000 times worse for you, buddy. And was it because of that that you decided to cover his case in in a couple of your episodes? You know, just that like storytelling angle to it, that Coen Brothers storytelling angle where it just kept folding into itself in the worst ways? Yeah, you know, I really, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm fascinated by stories like that where, where, you know, people are, what fascinates me about, you know, crime in general is how, okay. Two things. One, it's, it's very rare. Like the chances that you're going to get caught up in a murder investigation or some serial killer is going to throw you in the trunk of his car. I mean, they're so small. You shouldn't even be worried about it. We hear about it all all the time. We talk about it. We have podcasts about these things, right? But the only reason it's interesting is because they're so unique. You have a better chance of getting crushed by a a soda machine than you do of getting abducted by a serial killer. With the Jesse Smollett thing, you know, and these these crimes that I touch on with uh, a true crime this week, it's it's really just watching the the trends. Um, And it seems like you know, for whatever reason, it's probably not, it probably doesn't say something that great about humanity in general, but we, we kind of need, uh, it seems, um, a case to be concentrating on it at all times, or people get a little, get a little antsy. So they move on to the next thing and the next thing, like the Gabby Petito thing, uh, everybody got their energy out for that. And then, you know, it, it, it ended in such an anticlimactic way. Nobody was happy. And then, you know, the uh, Kyle Rittenhouse trial came around and people people had something to talk about again. So, you know, I, I, I like uh, going for the ride and, 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 and learning, learning what it says about us at the same time. What I try to do is is remind as as I'm reporting on these stories, as I'm as I'm talking about these these topics and big cases is try to remind people you know, the, what we should really be focusing on, you know, and I've, I've done, unfortunately, I've already reported on three or four school shootings in the, in the 10 weeks that I've been doing this. And um, what I try to, I, you know, I don't just talk about them for the salacious details. In fact, a lot of the times the de- the details of what specifically happened, I, I leave out because what I want to talk about is why, why we have AR-15 style assault rifles anyways what do we need them for they're not for hunting not animals anyway they're they're intimidating they're you know for yeah i want people to reconsider you know uh, gun laws and you know the the bigger picture behind these things because nothing's changing you know the only thing that changes is the location uh, of the school shooting um, we're not stopping these things and it, and it goes on and on and on and, um, you know, I'm not big enough to have an effect by that, but, you know, if I can get 10 people to look at it a little bit differently or, or think about it in a different way. Uh, it, um, I'm torn between saying it's an inspirational thing and it's a, a, one of the saddest things I've ever experienced is seeing the reaction of the kids who have gone through these school shootings, especially when you see the videos that they'll take during the school shootings. And uh, the latest one that happened when the, the children were taking a video with their cell phones and the shooter was trying to get in and how the kids handled that. Did you see that video? How the kids yeah. handled that? Yeah. It was it, amazing. They were weirdly calm, right? And, uh, you know, one, and they're like, okay, who, you know, and it's the police or somebody outside. So it's the good guys. And, but they're, they've been, these kids have been trained and, uh, you know, so they're like, okay, who is it really? And he's like, he's, and the police officer said something flippant, like, um, dude or, or whatever. Yeah. You say bro, I think Yeah, bro. said, yeah, it's cool. It's cool to let me in bro or something. And the guys are like, he said, bro, it must be the shooter, you know? And so they're diving out the windows and, you know, there's so much, I mean, such an American problem too. You know, the, uh, 
the fact that the kids were trained enough to like remain calm in that situation frightens me a little bit. You know, Casey is now in high school out here and they still have the Alice drills, which by the way, they started those things without explaining to the parents what was really going on. But, you know, they teach the kids out here that, you know, during these school shootings that you, if you're in a certain situation, you engage with the shooter that you throw desks and chairs and things at him and you try to tackle him. Like my kid didn't sign up for that. You know, I've, I've told him if he even hears a gunshot, I said, you jump, you know, you're, you're getting out of that building and in, you know, just running as far away from that school as possible. I don't like, we have something ingrained in us. You know, I think in this country where we want to be that hero and we want to be ready in that situation so that we can be the next John McClain and save everybody. And that just, I think, breeds more incidents like this because there's more guns out there, and it's a, uh, it's disheartening. It really is, and and just you said, it's a you know, it's an American problem that we have, and I I can't even handle how many times people will. I, I hate the like the phrase triggered now because like you can't even have an emotion about something without someone calling you triggered. Like you can't you can't do it. But yeah. you you see these like Twitter posts from, you know, representatives, Thomas Massey, who sends out this Twitter post of his whole family posing in front of the Christmas tree or whatever. All of them have these weapons and they're not like handguns. These are like these are like AR-15s and yeah. they're, they're significant weapons that they're all holding. And it says something like um, Santa bring ammo for Christmas or something like this. And that happened just days after uh, the school shooting that we just talked about. I mean, it's completely tone deaf. But if you bring it up, then you're triggered. Mm-hmm. Then then you're the one that that just can't handle, you know, you, you, you're trying to be too politically correct. or You're trying to, you know, stifle somebody's uh, Second Amendment rights. Yeah. Um, I, I mentioned this in, in a recent podcast, but you know, there was this major case out of Australia. I think it was like 15 years ago now or, or something where they had this mass shooting where I think 15 people were, were shot and killed to death before they apprehended the, the, the shooter. And uh, you know what they did was they changed the laws in Australia and uh, it hasn't happened again. And in Australia, you need to show a specific reason to have and an own a gun. And it can't just be because you think it looks cool on a Christmas card. It has to be because you have an infestation of wallabies uh, on your property or something. You have a, you have to have that specific need to get rid of something. And uh, um, you know, here we have something like Sandy hook. I, th- I really thought Sandy hook would be the turning point because it was an elementary situation and, and little, little kids. It just didn't, uh, it didn't change a thing, you know, and, and it's happened. Uh, you look at the numbers on these things, the, the, the shooting this past week was like, I think the something ridiculous, like the, like the 30th school shooting since August. And, uh, it's, it's nuts. We're, we're, our country is insane, full of crazy people. Yeah, and I don't understand how it becomes a political argument, you know. This is about safety, safety of children, for God's sake, you know. Kids who whose parents believe in both both sides of politics. I mean, the 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 answer's obvious. We need to start arming the children. I mean, that's the only <laughs> way we're going to have we're going to be able to start. We've already armed the teachers, and that didn't stop it. So we got to arm the kids now. Well, I mean, if if the kids were real in the first place, these are crisis right. actors. Of course, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god oh we're boy. on a sinking ship we're, we're yeah. rearranging chairs on the on the deck of the titanic it's it's been lovely working with you guys but that's where we're at <laughs> well okay <laughs> speaking of uh the titanic um are there that this is a terrible segue i apologize <laughs> <laughs> are there any future uh james renner live shows that we can look oh, forward to great i want to you know it depends like i'm waiting to see what happens with with uh covid and uh you know whether or not that's something that that i can can really do and get people out for again i i as soon as as soon as it's clear as soon as you know um i I want to i want to get like i've done the east coast i've done west coast i want to do like middle middle i want to do like denver and las vegas and you know around there um but uh yeah i uh I, I I love I love those live shows. Getting up there and and you know mixing comedy with with the you know stand up and true crime and uh, it was amazing. I can't wait to get back. I, you know, but 
you know, I, I, I'm still not entirely sure guys that this isn't the beginning of the end, you know, that, uh, <laughs> I mean, not to be a downer, but, uh, uh, you know, people, <laughs> you know, they, uh, I, I'm here in Akron in Akron general, uh, they just parked this big trailer out next to the hospital because the morgue's full. And, and how surreal is that to say it? It sounds like it, it's like that scene from Ghostbusters, you know, where, um, you know, Ray and Winston are driving in the car and he's like, the dead are coming back. And it's like, we're in the end times. And it's like, well, we got a tractor trailer pulled up to the hospital because there's too many dead people. I definitely went on a rent. Uh, what about you guys? Are you guys going out on the town anytime soon? No, no, we're <laughs> we're right there with you. I mean, we had a, there was a, there was a glimmer of hope and then, um, you know, we're getting taken over by a new variant, so yeah. we got to buckle down again. You know, we got to hunker, hunker back in the uh, hunker in the bunker is what I was going to say, <laughs> but didn't realize it was going to rhyme. Hopefully, CrimeCon in Vegas is uh, still goes off without a hitch. Yeah, you know, in 2021, the spring and summer seemed okay, so I would expect that again in 2022. I guess. Are we going to play? Some slots when we're down there? Are we gonna hit we're gonna the slot? smoke yeah. cigarettes and get a tattoo and play <laughs> slots? You know what? We should we should uh, um, we should plan a heist. Uh, you know, it should be that it'd be the last people they'd expect that the the pot the true crime podcast hosts pulling off the best heist at uh, at the casino. I'm, well, I'm you in. heard it here first, folks. <laughs> Shh, it'll be a secret though. I do have hope. You you know you mentioned Crime Con and you you this is something that'll be happening in the mid spring, mid mid you know early mm-hmm. mid spring. I by that time we know they're working hard on on boosters and vaccines and and if if people will understand the 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 repercussions of not taking a vaccine based on based on last year based on the last like 16 months 18 months yeah no one wants the economy devastated again no <laughs> one wants to <laughs> not go out no people I, I i would love to go to the grocery store without a mask on but i'm not going to do that you know eventually it'll come back around so maybe the whole end of days uh maybe you're not accounting for the 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 uh, the, the response to it I wish I, I wish I could be that that optimistic. I uh, I went out and purchased. I have a box of um, of seeds uh, in the basement in case the uh, in case the shit hits the fan. Um, that's my uh, that's my insurance clause. At least I'll have kale and carrots uh, as the world burns. <laughs> I'm I'm moving I'm moving right to Svalbard. <laughs> Where's that? I got to make sure I just said that correctly. Svalbard is like up past like the uh, Scandinavian peninsula. Oh, yeah, it's the yeah. world's, uh, oh, they, the... they have all the seeds there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's a good, that was a good reference. I like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Svalbard. Yeah, global seed vault. Well, that, that I think that must be where like your people must be hail from, from there somewhere. Aren't you Scandinavian? Yeah. My little Swedish flag right here. There you go. Yeah, the the reindeer yeah. stars. <laughs> Thank you. Well, no matter, no no matter what, you're always welcome for a cheeseburger at the Crawl Space Studios in Wormtown. Anytime, I like, any I day like of the week. I like mine with lettuce and tomatoes. Heinz fifty seven and French fried potatoes, and microwaved, and microwaved. <laughs> All right. Well, thank cool. you very Thanks. much for, for, for having me on any, you know, anytime I can return the favor. Uh, I, I can't because I don't have guests on my show, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but we should hang sometime. You guys should come out to yeah. crime con UK next time and yeah, uh, we we'll live it to. up on a, you know, we'll take a lorry down to the uh, lift and have some <laughs> uh, bangers and mash. I don't know. I've lost it. <laughs> Do you know why they call them bangers? No. Oh, well, because back in the day when they need to, needed to ration food, they would inject their sausages with water to make them seem bigger. So when you fried them, when you put them in a pan, they would pop. Oh, interesting. Done. Now I know. Also, the origin of gumshoe yes. is so boring. Gotta bring it's it back so around. boring that we're just going to go with yours. <laughs> okay, great, great. You heard it here first, folks. 